Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and this is going to be really a, a, a video that I think is going to shock a lot of people. Uh, I, I just, I believe it's going to be a shocker, and it is, I have to say it's a conjecture at this point there. I have been researching like crazy. I kind of stumbled onto this information and I don't know what to think of it at this point but I figured I would share it with you our listeners here to let you think about it for yourselves there uh, I have on this screen here Barry Chamish Return of the Giants uh, lecture and uh, I'm gonna play a clip here uh, from Barry's lecture there that he did uh, it's been a little while back uh, since he did this of course Barry Chamish in fact this lecture the lecture was six years ago. Uh, Barry has passed away uh, since then, and uh, very uh, sad to hear that that note there. But Barry talks about seven foot gray aliens that visited Israel from I think it's from 1993 to 1995, and he calls it the return of the giants, the Nephilim. And because of that, and because uh, Barry speaks about it like that, I've done some research, uh, biblically speaking, uh, because Barry's going to be talking about gray aliens. And he talks about that as being a return of the Nephilim. Now, before I play Barry's video there, let me share with you a little information here. This is from Ancient History, published by Christina Sarek. Uh, she is a, a just a regular journalist. I, I looked her up a little bit just to kind of get an idea of who she was. Proof of aliens in ancient Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphics, relics hidden in the Rockefeller Museum. And this is one of those relics uh, depicted right here that... Uh, that was hidden in what they call the Rockefeller Museum. It says, while the U.S. government and its military industrial uh, cutouts continue to drip drip the faucet of partial disclosure, we have evidence dating back to ancient Egypt and one of the most revered religious temples in the land pointing to absolute existence of UFOs and likely an alien encounters by prehistoric people. The Temple of Seti was built in the uh, Abydos, Egypt, Thought to be sacred landscape, there are a number of temples built in this area, but one of them stands out due to its unusual hieroglyphics. On a panel that was carved more than 5,000 years ago, there are clear depictions of a helicopter, a spaceship, and fighter planes. This was in the time when man was thought to be ignorant of all aviation dynamics. Though some skeptics claim these images were chipped out of stone and added at a later date. You know, so just being fair and pointing that out. Highly unusual since hieroglyphic panels were usually carved out of one large piece of stone and then put in place. There are also indications of the panel being modified. And yet another Egyptian panel, Egyptian women with elongated skulls hold small childlike people in the laps that look nothing like humans but instead resemble aliens and statues of these elongated skulls. People abound throughout the region. Now, the reason why I bring some of this up here, these Egyptian things that they're talking about, uh, and some of these hieroglyphics, is because of trying to uh, look for evidence that there was actually a um, gray alien species going back to biblical times. After all, Barry Chamish, in the video you're going to listen to in just a moment there, speaks about them being the return of the Nephilim. So, in this particular video right here that was done, it is believed that, uh, and let me just play a little clip of this for you. It is believed that, uh, and I forget this guy's name here, let me back up just a little bit there. Um... This man right here, they had discovered some ancient artifacts inside his library behind a bookshelf there from Egypt, and every bit of that depicting that of what was believed to be um, alien type of origins. Listen in. Well, if I get it to play. Um, well, 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 let's see if it will work. In by representatives of the Rockefeller Museum, shortly after the discovery became known. 
Sir William, who has made more major discoveries than any other archaeologist in history, first went to Egypt to survey the pyramids in 1880. His vast collection of discoveries is now housed at the Petrie Museum in London. These mysterious relics, which were found in a secret room behind a large bookcase, could possibly confirm a direct connection between ancient Egypt and an extraterrestrial civilization. By the way, right there on the floor, that's that um, alien-looking face there. It's very similar what appears to be um, let me take you to that real quick there. That is this particular one right here. Uh, and it does kind of look like a gray. Uh, and that is on the floor in this video in that room right there where this was discovered at there. Among the many items found were two small mummified bodies of possible alien... All right, and I'm not going to play the whole thing there, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background there. We're going to go to the biblical part of this in just a moment. Let me play here with, from Barry, and notice immediately what he says at the very beginning of the video. That's very important, so listen closely as he starts off. The giants are back. Giants were recorded just twice in Israel's history, from the time previous to the flood, to the ascension of King David, and today. In between 2,800 years, no giants. They're back. We're going to try and figure out why. Luckily for Israel, our aliens are extremely gracious. They leave us physical evidence absolutely unique. We don't fit any pattern. And there's a direct relationship between ancient sites and our UFOs. Let's start at the very first uh, UFO of the, of the wave, the new wave, 1987, September. I apologize of the Haifa. quality of the video. He sees what he thinks video. is a disabled helicopter. Pulls over to the side of the road, gets out of his car, and there is a flash, a beam of light, and then goes away, disappears over the Mediterranean. Two days later, he returns. And on the sands of Shikmona Beach is burnt into the sands is an image of the UFO. About 15 meters across. And what's important is what wasn't burned. The vegetation that remained showed an image of a pilot, a UFO knot, three and a half feet tall in front of a control board. They left us their picture. And that was in the end. Eight months later, another one. Fifteen uh, meters I'm going to move forward a little bit. Expect it. She looks a little, maybe ten yards, and there's the giant. Israel's first publicized UFO encounter, April 20th, 1993. A seven-foot giant, metallic clothing, wearing what she calls a beekeeper's hat. A sombrero with a veil in front of it. She isn't frightened. None of these people are frightened. She says to it, take off your hat. I want to see your face. It answers her telepathically. Uh, that's the way it is. Can't be done. She has two more uh, circles in, over the next 10 days. Within the circles are two materials. One is a silicon. Now, I'm pleased to report Michael Hesman took uh, an example of the silicon and had it tested in Germany. And it's the same result as in Israel. Purest silicon um, possible. Uh, so far, mankind can't get it that pure. Certainly not natural. No, it's just sort of, anyone wants to see it later, I brought some. Okay, you're more than welcome. You put your hand in these circles, and it comes out red. Okay? Now, I didn't like it. It didn't come off easily. And who knew if it was radioactive would eat through the skin? I mean, it's not something that you necessarily want in your hand. Nonetheless, it was collected, I'm tested. It was mostly cadmium. Okay, I'm going to pause this here. I'll put a link in the description below for you. Now, what's important with, with what Barry Chalmers says here, he calls it the return of the giants. Uh, Barry writes a book about these events there. There ends up being seven encounters 
of tall gray aliens. Uh, I think the tallest was nine foot. Uh, that was the very scary one for most, but, but most of the encounters are going to be seven foot tall grays, and he calls it the return of the Nephilim. He says recorded in Israel's history, you have before the flood, after the flood during King David's time, uh, which is what we talk about quite frequently when we talk about the Nephilim during Joshua's time, uh, the giants that they were dealing with. And then, of course, biblically, I have often pointed you to Ezra, uh, and I'm going to bring you out to that right now, where we get, um, in the book of Ezra, we get a mingling of the seed of the children of Israel when they're in captivity. Uh, this is where... Uh, doing according to their abominations, uh, even the Canaanites, Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, etc. For they have taken their daughters for themselves and their sons, so that they have the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. And that was those peoples right there, the Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, etc., Egyptians, right on down. Uh, and the, the hand of the princes and the rulers were involved in this. And we know that Ezra demands that they put away the wives, put away these children that are born unto them. But if you've ever gone and read in chapter 10 and how many, I forget, I actually did a count of this one time. It's a lot of men that were involved in this. But as you go down, you find out that Jonathan, the son of Ashal, and Josiah, the son of, uh, of Tikva, stood up against this matter. And they refused. And they were Levites. Uh, or a Levite helped the Mish Mishalum, the Shav uh, and Shabbatai, the Levite, helped them. Help them to do what? Keep their kids. Keep their wives. And of course, when uh, Cyrus returns back the peoples to their lands, they go back with their wives. So this mingled seed stayed with Israel. And of course, even if you took the ones that put away their wives and stuff, their kids and wives still go back to the land because when uh, Cyrus gives the decree for everyone to turn to their homelands, the the, uh, the Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, etc., they were living in the land of Israel at that time, so they all went back to Israel anyway. So they still ended up back in Israel. Didn't matter which way you did it, they still ended up back in Israel. All right, so we have that. You also have, uh, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, and this is where I normally uh, go to uh, Numbers chapter 13 to prove the part about the Nephilim. Right here we have it. The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim, right there, Hamin uh, Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. So Anak, is a son of a fallen angel. Now, when we think of these fallen angels, everybody wants to think of these things as pretty little boys and everything, and they're so nice and cute. But undoubtedly, they weren't so nice and cute. And so that's something you want to think about, right? Now, anyway, now this is where you're really going to have to be, you, you have to put on your thinking cap now. Uh, because what I'm about to share with you is, could be, and I'm going to say it as a conjecture, it could be evidence of the grays biblically. And uh, so I will say it as a conjecture, not as an absolute, but I want you to think about it, and we'll just have to see where it goes. Now, here we find here, this is in Hosea, uh, and... Let me go up here. Hosea chapter 7. Ephraim, he mixeth himself with the peoples. That's the first problem. Ephraim is doing just like the children of Israel or the children of Judah did when they went over into, um, 
when they were taken into captivity over to what we'd call modern day Iran, the Babylonian kingdom. Now this is why this is why the house of Israel got in so much trouble anyway. They were mingling their seed all the time with these giants, these Nephilim race, mingled race people. So as Ephraim, he mixed mixeth himself with the peoples. Ephraim has become a cake not turned. Uh, right here, Ephraim Haya Uga, Uga is a cake. Uh Fuka. Okay, it's without the turning. The Bali is without. Then it says here, strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. Now, this is what caught my attention. Gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. It doesn't even make sense in English to say that. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. The two don't go together when you look at the English side of this translation. So I'm about to challenge your thinking right now. To begin with, the word hair is not even in the text. It does say strangers have devoured his strength, or actually eaten his strength. They have they when it says devour when it uses the words devour, it's eaten it up. Uchal, uchalu, okay, that would be eaten his zarim kachol. They have eaten up his strength. And he doesn't know it. Then it says, Gam Siba. Also, also the gray. Whoa, no gray hair? No, it doesn't say gray hair at all. Also the gray, Zeraka Bo. That the word zeraka is a very unique Hebrew word, and it does mean here and there. It means here and there. Also, the gray is here and there upon him. Vehu lo yadea, and he doesn't know it. Why would it use the word zaka here and there? If you go to the time where they just had recently this talk about these aliens, uh, allegedly seven foot tall, and I believe they were grays as well, in Peru, they were trying to shoot them with buckshot and couldn't do anything to them. They were moving about, boom, boom, boom. And they would say the buckshot had no effect on them. You see, gray aliens, as well as others like reptilians, they have the ability to do what we call move in and out of the ether. They are able to move here and there. Here in our realm and there in their realm, moving into the ether, here and there, and that's why you would not know it. So when it says that strangers, zarim, and that's in the plural, uchalu zarim kacho, strangers are eating up his strength, and he doesn't know it. They devour. your emotion. They suck and drain off of your spirit. And then it goes also, the gray is here and there upon him. And he doesn't know it. 
Could it actually be speaking of the gray aliens? Ephraim, he mixes himself with the peoples. He's, he's already mingled his seed, his bloodline. Obviously, just like Ezra and Ezra, where the house of Judah did, with Nephilims, Nephilim. Okay? Then, another place in Deuteronomy. And again, it's very interesting what is before the verse and after. And many times, if you ever notice, remember how many prophecies we read about with Jesus? You'll get the part of the prophecy, but it seems like nothing seems to go with it before and after. But then you'll have a prophecy that directly speaks about Jesus Christ, Him coming. And then it seems to go into a completely different subject altogether, but yet all in the same verse or the same... Um, how would you call it? We would have it in the same uh, uh, chapter. And maybe only one verse applied to Jesus Christ in the day we're living in. So it doesn't surprise me when I read these things. Anyway, the wasting of hunger and the devouring of the fiery bolt. And bitter destruction and the teeth of beast will I send upon them with the venom of crawling things of the dust, literally of serpents, snakes. doesn't use the word nachash. It's a different word for there for a serpent. But nonetheless, it still uses like a snake. Without shall the sword bereave, and in the chambers terror, slaying both young man and virgin, the suckling, now they put on there the man with gray hairs. But again, it doesn't use the word hair. Now, granted, there are scriptures that still use just the word gray, and we assume it to be gray hairs. But watch the way the whole thing words out. Verse 26, I thought I would make an end of them. I would make their memory cease from among men. Let's look at this in the Hebrew language. In. Without shall the sword bereave, and in the chambers terror, slaying both young man, get over here, All right. Slaying both young man, gem bachor, gem betula, also the virgin, betula, yonach, see, with a suckling, in other words, a child, and im ish. Siba, with the gray man. That's interesting. It, you could say, with the man of gray hairs, even though the word hairs is not there. But could it be referring to a Nephilim? And are they really saying that these grays are Nephilim? Again, I, I really don't know what to think of this. Um, had, if it wasn't for the fact that this is being really linked up, like in the case, I will send upon them with the venom of serpents, crawling things of the dust. Im chamat zachule afar. Afar is the word for dust. Uh, Zohali, that's the, 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 like a worm is literally what it is. Without shall the sword bereave and in the chambers of terror slaying both young man, virgins, uh, the suckling with the man, with the gray man. That's literally the way you translate with the gray man. And then you look at Hosea. 
Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Also, the greys are here and there upon him, and he doesn't know it. You see, it doesn't make sense to say, especially in Hosea, it doesn't make sense to say gray hair. You're saying that the Zarim have eaten up his strength and he doesn't know it. The strangers have eaten up his strength. Then what in the world would gray hair have to do that gray hair, you know, he's got gray hair upon his head and he doesn't know why that's there either. The two don't go together. Does it make sense to you what I'm saying? They, you can't say strangers, Zarim, which can easily be Nephilim or fallen angels when you use the word Zarim. Strangers have devoured his strength and he doesn't know it and then to turn around and say oh and he's got gray hair by the way and it's it's gray a little bit over here a little bit over there and he really doesn't know it what is he that stupid or is it actually talking about the strangers have eaten him up he doesn't know it and also the grays are here and there upon him now that makes more sense because they're eating up his strength in the first place and he doesn't know it. And then, of course, it says in verse 10, And the pride of Israel testified to his face, but they have not returned unto the Lord their God, nor sought him for all of this. My goodness, friends. You know, there's another scripture, and I forget where it's at, but, but God actually says, a no people. I'll provoke them to jealousy with a no people. You know, we so often we think of that as Gentiles. Gentiles are not a no people. They may be Gentiles, but they're not a no people. I tell you what, this is really getting interesting if you ask me. I just wanted to share that with you to see what you guys thought. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Uh, doing a little testimony over on uh, our Patreon channel if you want to check that out. Uh, a little story I wanted to share with you guys and I thought might be a blessing to you. God bless you.